Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Laser 11 um, Distributed Greenery Vegetation Distribué with our distinguished guests uh, who you were able to read their bios in the initial document. Um, I would like to say thank you to the people in attendance. And um, bienvenue à toutes et à tous. Uh, bienvenue à nos invités. Vous avez pu lire leur bio dans le document d'introduction et j'aimerais dire un grand merci à tout le monde dans l'assistance. So I am Giselle Trudel and I'd like to start by saying I respectfully acknowledge elders past, present, and those emerging of the Ganyankehagda nation on whose unceded lands I live and I work. Je reconnais respectueusement les aînés présents émergents de la nation Ganyankehagda gardienne des terres et des eaux avec lesquelles je vis et je travaille. Nous remercions Hexagram avec son équipe et son appui pour, le, pour leur appui continu dans l'organisation et la diffusion des lasers. Hexagram est subventionné par le Fonds de recherche du Québec Société et Culture. We gratefully thank Hexagram and its team for the continued support and the organization of the dissemination of our lasers. And Hexagram is funded by the Fonds de recherche du Québec Société et Culture. The event today is mostly in English, but we can do translations as required. And please know it is being recorded uh, so that you, if you don't want to appear in the documentation, please uh, turn off your camera. L'activité sera majoritairement en, France, en anglais. Uh, on peut faire des traductions ponctuelles aux besoins. Elle est aussi enregistrée. Alors, si vous ne voulez pas apparaître dans la documentation, mais merci d'éteindre vos caméras. At the moment of the discussion, where we can take your comments uh, live by voice, so you'll just have to put up your hand in the uh, interface to, to let uh, us know that you want to inter, inter, uh, interact. And um, donc, au moment de la discussion, vous, vous allez nous prendre vos questions et commentaires de vive voix, alors vous n'avez qu'utilisé la main dans l'interface de Zoom. So now on to you, Nina. Hello, everybody. And uh, thank you. Thank you for everybody who was involved in the organization of this event. Thank you, Giselle. And uh, thank you, especially the participants who came to participate in our 11th Montreal laser. The lasers initiated by Piero Scarufi in 2008 had very modest beginnings. But today, this bottom up independently organized network is presented in 50 locations around the world. The top topics, the participants, the presentation formats vary from place to place. Our 10 prior lasers testify to our independent team. And our future plans attest to our flexibility. Over to you. I'd just like to give an outline of what's happening today. Uh, Nina Tsiklady, myself, and Chantal Tsipari will give a brief overview of our uh, analysis of the 10 previous lasers. Then Annick Bureau will do her presentation, followed by Beatrice Herrera and Francois Joseph Lapointe. And then it will be Matthew Halpenny who will be moderating the discussion period. So now, um, just a quick overview of why we're doing this. So Nina and I are celebrating, we celebrated 10, year, 10 editions of lasers, and we started having a seven-year itch. It's, we started in 2014, and we said, okay, what's, what's been going on with these lasers? What do we want to do differently from now on? And at the same time, we also wanted to write an article. And so with this 11th laser, we're now entering into a new format, which has shorter presentations, moderated discussions, um, international guests, and also more implication with students that are student members of Hexagram. So we invited Chantal Tepari, who is a Hexagram student member, to look back at the 10 previous lasers and tell us, Chantal, what did you find about the in, in this process? Thank you, Giselle. Hi, everyone. Uh, I first want to say that I'm very pleased to be part of this project uh, and to also say that I phrased my part beforehand to make it short and fluid since we have less than 10 minutes and my English is not as fluent as my French. 
So uh, I've been asked by Giselle and Exagram to review and analyze the content of the 10 previous lasers through the qualitative analysis of the software in vivo, which requires textual matter. I first had to proceed with the transcription of the recordings of the 10 lasers. I was a bit, it was a bit of challenging because the conversation in these lasers were too complex to be transcribed accurately with a speech to text software. This was because of the content themselves and the mix of languages and various accents. AI also struggled with the species of language apparently. So I did the transcription manually by here, not always word to word, within a sort of principle of emergence, retaining what was the most resonant among the abundant data. An emerging analysis is also what the software allows to do through the coding process, so we were in sync. The process of coding is a particular approach to examine the matters of the text through a mode of characterization that emerged in the process of analysis itself. So I created sets of code with the help of Giselle and then coded and subcoded segments of the recordings accordingly within the software. From this arose a certain cartography of the lasers, both quantitative and qualitative, giving an overview of the lasers in terms of statistic, singular and recurring patterns of ideas in relation to each other. Through this image and process of listening, thinking, making, and rewriting, degree of subjectivity is unfolded between myself, the recordings, and the software. So for me, it has been an interesting process of coding done in collaboration with the software. How did this operate for you, Nina, when you received the coding to start the writing of the text with Giselle? Well, used by Giselle, initiative, the diffraction method. Now, this was a very unusual experience for me. I have never done it before. And first I was totally lost, but I learned a lot. But I don't think I can explain it exactly. So please, Giselle, tell us about the diffraction method. <laughs> Yeah, so this diffraction method that we employed in, in Latin diffraction means to break into pieces. And so we were inspired by the feminist philosopher um, and biologist, uh, Donna Haraway, who developed this technique that's called diffractive reading and writing. And so diffraction in our case was a way to break away from conventional thinking and writing logics. And so we, it was a way to take the different moments, the different pieces, and then reconfigure them into a new composition. And so as recomposed from the fragments. And so with Donna Haraway, we understand that these moments, these fragments are inseparable from the immediacy and the intimacy uh, that in which they occurred along with places, things, and peoples. So we looked at one word that was recurring throughout this whole set of um, 10 lasers, and it was highlighted in the, transcription, in the transcriptions. And, um, and so we, we looked at this word, and then we wrote our text uh, accordingly. And the word is called movement, and that's how we composed our texts. And so, Nina, did you want to add something? Well, you know, for me, it was difficult because I have used yeah, and like uh, really style all the time. No. But nevertheless, we finished it and we submitted on March the uh, 22nd to Leonardo, our article. And uh, this is all about how the, the laser talks in a diffraction method. And it's coming up. So if you want to know more about the article, watch for the Leonardo publications. And now I would like to invite and introduce briefly uh, Anik Bureau, an old friend and collaborator in many, many things. And I please, Anik, where are you? I'm here. Um, so good day, because it's midday for you and it's evening for me. 
Um, thank you, Nina, and thank you, Giselle, to have invited me to this uh, laser. Um, um, I'm very interested by the way you analyzed uh, your lasers. This is something which is uh, useful uh, for me uh, later. So this is a, a real pleasure and an honor for me to, to share the floor with a critical gardening team. And I'm super uh, um, um, eager to listen to their talk. So now I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Traveling Plant Project, the veridical travel around the world of a true imaginary plant. So in one sentence, TP, as we call it, Traveling Plant, it's a dis distributed collective curatorial project um, focusing on the vegetal and it's in between fiction. That is, it is based on a storyline of a plant that wants to travel the world and back, and reality that is uh, with concrete uh, actions. So it is a collective uh, project because it is run by the five of us, uh, Robertina Shebianic, Tatiana Kuroshkina, Claudia Schnuck, Marta Menezes, and myself. And we are really running the whole project since we're very beginning together. We created it together. So it is a, a, a curatorial project in uh, several ways, but in the first several I could um, explain. Uh, one is an attempt uh, to provide answers to questions that every one of us asked uh, ourselves uh, in the last two years, which is how to organize exhibitions when we can't travel anymore. And following this, is it still a good idea anyway to keep on traveling uh, the way we did before and to organize exhibitions the way we did before? And one also key element of this curatorial project for me <clears throat> is how to maintain links, exchanges without dissolving ourselves in the virtual world and uh, hiding behind our screens and without drowning into an ultra local um, national or even nationalist realm. So it's important to be um, inscribed, to inscribe ourselves in our local environment, but I think it's also a threat to be too much into um, uh, or only into the, the local. It's a distributed curation. By this, we mean that uh, the five of us are not choosing the artists or the art project that will be uh, shown or exhibited or promoted during, uh, during the Traveling Plant Project, but we are working with curators and organizations. We might go and ask people to join or people can come to us with both ways. And those people are going to organize event for the plant that is art event at each step of a travel. So basically they are including themselves into the, um, the narrative and, and the project. So what is common um, to each of those location and each of those um, curators is the common topic that is the vegetal, the plant and the narrative, uh, the storyline, the plant that travels as a link, as a binder, but each event should be as diverse uh, as possible in terms of artistic projects, format and aesthetics. And the idea is that uh, this project is going to be as wide as possible um, with as many different components as possible. This is uh, uh, my ultimate goal is uh, that we have projects that actually none of the five of us would have imagined or would have thought or would have curated themselves. It's really to, to become uh, as, again, as wide and large uh, as, um, as possible. Well, what is it not working? Uh, yeah. Um, 
So I said that um, the link, the binder, um, is the vegetal, and actually there is a, a real plant at the origin of the project, and I wanted to introduce you to her because I think it's uh, it's important. And um, uh, plant and vegetal um, actually are a real binder among us humans because they are uh, part of, of, of the uh, organisms that provide the oxygen that we need to breathe, to, to survive. So they, this plant is a binder metaphorically, but it's also a binder um, physically, so, I mean, a real uh, binder. So uh, traveling plant is built around the story and narrative, which is uh, which has somehow uh, reversed, put upside down the usual narrative of people, uh, scientists going uh, all over the world and collecting stuff and bringing it back. And, um, uh, studying it. So the, this time the narrative is that it's a plant that would travel around the world and meet uh, people, artists, uh, artworks all over uh, uh, travel and, and, and uh, report. Uh, so as I mentioned, it is in between uh, fiction and reality. And, uh, and among the fiction, we have produced a few elements already. One is a very radical travel around the, pro around the world of a tree imaginary prompt preparatory logbook. So we did that in 2020 for our Selectronica Festival in Linz. And we asked people around the world to write a short stories, a short story about what the plant could expect if it was traveling to their place. So we have, um, and it's online on our website, and I, we have about 60 texts, and I really recommend you to read them. Some are funny, some are poetic, uh, some are um, tragic. It, it's a really, really beautiful collection of text. As um, among the narrative too, uh, and the fiction, we have uh, built a surrogate body for the plant. This is this ceramic object that has been produced by Marta de Menezes, and which is going to travel instead of a real plant to travel to the different places. So we're really going to send this ceramic uh, object to the different portion of the world where it's going to, to happen. Uh, but the, the project is also, as I said, we could have stayed into the narrative, into the fiction and build stories and so on and so forth. And mind you, we have millions of ideas. So this is not very difficult. This is not what we're supposed to do. But we decide, we, we really want to do it for real. We really want to have um, events organized in different lo locations throughout the world. And the first one is this one which is called, the, the artwork is called Cruel of Tucuman. It's by the artist Paola Bruna. And it was under the curator was Tatiana Kuroshkina from Co-Artist in Barcelona. It took place in Barcelona in July 21. And the Instit uh, Botanical Institute of Barcelona in this room, which is the Salvador family room, and uh, those people were um, uh, botanists that in between the 17th and the 19th century collected a huge amount of objects, animals, plants, and everything you could, uh, you could think of. So this is uh, uh, an artwork in answer to, to, the, to this collection. And now we'd like to show you uh, a video about this work. It's very short. Trail of Tucuman is artistic research about our binary way of thinking that is reflected on the stories that we put in a plant, uh, in this case, in an invasive plant, uh, which is called Araujia sericifera. Uh, this plant has like two stories, the one in its origin, uh, this plant is originary from South America, from Argentina, and there it's part of an ecosystem, and it's also the habitat of the monarch <coughs> butterfly. So it has like in a good consideration for uh, preserving biodiversity. Instead, in Europe and especially in, in 
countries with Mediterranean climate. Then the common name of Parochia cerevifera is the cruel plant, and it's uh, designed to be eradicated because it's considered an invasive species. These species uh, strangulate local trees and citrix, and, and it's forbidden to, to plant it and to have it. No? So I was interested in these dual uh, stories about the same plant, which reflects, as I said, our morality, uh, our human morality. No? And also about the common name, the cruel plan, and and in instead of in South America, it's uh, known as Tucuman Jasmine, and that's the how the name of the project comes from. Like cruel of Tucuman is a combination of two of the two stories. And what I try to do in 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 this exhibition is to break these dual binary stories into a multiplicity of stories that goes from the nice because the plant is, is, is beautiful in, in itself. Also, the it's very sexual, the fruit is very sexual, and also stories that happened while I was working with the plant and related to how we manage the ecosystem. And uh, also, I was very interested in this plant horror that is reflected in the movies, no? and what uh, what talks about us also, no? our fears of something that grown without our control. I like this project a lot, not only because this is a, um, an extremely beautiful poetic uh, work by Paola Bruna, because it has many layers uh, woven together, but also because we started the project um, um, with a plan that should not have traveled. And um, I think that this is also a very interesting uh, message uh, to start the project with. So I invite you to go and see the website and more later. Thank you. Okay, and I think I kept my 10 minutes, right? Very good, very good. Merci, Annick. Merci beaucoup. Uh, on va passer maintenant à um, Beatrice Herrera et François Joseph Lapointe. Merci. One second, we will share our presentation. Can you see it? Yes, it is. Oui. Beatrice. <laughs> well, hello. We're the um, Critical Gardening Collective, and we're here in Montreal. There's a, there's a group of us working together basically to create um, a series of works around the idea of moss gardens. Uh, so this is us, and we are trying to figure out how to create a, another perspective on the on on a vegetable environment. We're also working with plants, and uh, we're also working around the idea of travel. Um, the project started with the idea of what is happening in the bipolar regions of the world, meaning the extreme north and the extreme south. And one of the plants that fascinated us was the entire colonies of mosses that exist in the far northern tundras and southern tundras. And one of the things that we realized when we were trying to create the idea of building a garden here in Montreal, we have a project to build a moss garden in the botanical gardens. And the travel to uh, the far north and the far south is that it, to a certain extent, we were engaging in a, almost a caricature of the old scientific expedition to gather samples, except for one thing, which was that the life that we're trying to, to bring back 
the thing that we're trying to show is sort of uh, something that for most of us is invisible. You know, it's sitting on the side of the sidewalk. Uh, we don't notice it. It's a dried up tiny little crust of something. The idea of a moss garden is still very rare for most of us. So we went back and this just shows an image of an old Zen garden, which is one of the only cultures that we saw that actually create gardens out of something like moss. So basically why mosses? Because we consider them usually as a lesser form of life, totally opposite of the famous charismatic polar bear uh, representative of the loss of biodiversity caused by the Anthropocene. So this garden for the Anthropocene based on mosses focuses on these existence moindre, lesser form of life which in the phylogeny of, of plants are like in, in the middle right here. So these are the, the masses, uh, anthrocerot masses and hepatic masses, the bryophytes. So the, 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 the plants that usually are traveling, <laughs> the, the plants that, that are traveling with you and it are usually uh, the, the flowering plants at the top of the phylogeny, we're at the bottom of the phylogeny. So these mosses are, as uh, Beatrice put it, uh, almost invisible to us. And we're focusing on a specific type of mosses that are called bipolar biophytes or bipolar mosses, which as you can see from these distrib geographical distributions, they're only found at the North Pole, close to the North Pole and close to the South Pole. So thus the, the, the name bipolar mosses. So some species are found in the tropics, but most of them are, are not found near the tropics or, or close to the equator. So they are either uh, North or South and why they are appearing in, in these uh, disjoint distribution is still puzzling scientists. Is it a case of vicariant biogeography? Is it dispersal? And so part of the project will be to interview scientists to know more about the, the fate of these mosses. So we've identified uh, 17 different species of bipolar mosses that appear both at the North Pole and close to the South Pole. And three of them, number 13, 14, and 15 here, uh, are also found at the Quebec latitude. So if we go <laughs> close to, to a park here, we can find some of these mosses, but most of them are found only north and south. Thus, the traveling part of the project will be to go to these remote locations. So, we'll, so the, the green squares are the collection sites that we will visit to identify, observe, and collect plants uh, first, we will go to north of Finland in Kilbisjärvi with our uh, colleagues from the BioArt Society that I probably know already. And we will go also to the Tierra del Fuego, to Navarino, uh, with colleagues from Universitat de Magallanes. And so we will go north and south to collect these plants. And the red spot here is the botanical garden. So basically, we have two remote localities and one local spot where we'll bring back the plants to create this garden. Beatrice. So there's, a, there's two things that we immediately realized when we started trying to imagine the, the physicality of how we would do this. And the first one is mosses are amazingly strange life forms. First of all, it's a complete mystery how they travel between the North and South. Um, and this is one of the things that we want to talk to scientists about. But the other thing is the, their life cycles, what they actually need to survive is, is quite different than what a regular house plant would need. Uh, so what you see here are actually just some of the initial experiments that we're starting to carry out with materials to try to understand our project and our travel is creating almost like these little spores of objects that we're going to abandon, you know, not, not in a destructive way, hopefully. So a lot of material experiments have gone around two things, which are 
how to provide energy in a non-destructive way, and how to create something that can actually become part of its environment and encourage the growth of life forms on it over a very slow period of time. Uh, we're using a lot of experiments and prototypes right now around the idea of fuel cells, of actually using the natural chemical processes of moss to generate energy, to use wind energy, since both the places we'll be visiting are like the windiest spots on the face of the earth, but also clay, just because it can be a, a porous membrane that can absorb moisture and actually encourage the all the spores to land on it. And, Almost all our experiments right now are around these materials. This just shows in a very simple way how we were kind of imagining the structure of the communication part of the project. Uh, in Montreal, we would have a set of databases and out on the field, we would have a very simple system with sensors to try to understand the microenvironments and the micro little habitats in which the mosses would be growing naturally. Because it's going to be a naturally, how do I say this? We're not going to be watering these things. We're not going to be taking care of them. So it's more as if we are going to see if we can have an intervention in trying to understand what already exists rather than actually create an environment from, from the beginning. From the, um, the plan for the botanical garden itself that is creating the garden here in Montreal, it's a, a bit different in that we want to manipulate the scale and create large scale things that will be driven by bicycle mechanisms and motors in order to have irrigation systems, which we're hoping will actually make humans that are embedded in these structures feel around the size of the insects and bacteria that live in the ecosystems of moss, which functionally are almost uh, working like miniature forests. So we'll see how that will work in the future and how we'll be able to encourage the mosses as we study them to propagate and inhabit a space here in the city. Yeah, to to end with this last slide, this is a list of people who were very handful uh, with us and, and also the founders. So Shirk and uh, Fonds de Recherche du Québec who are uh, funding this project. The collective started a, a year ago, but the, the project started with Thierry, Beatrice and I when we actually submitted the grant proposals and we're happy to, to be successful. And uh, we're looking forward to your questions now. Merci, merci beaucoup. Um, thank you so much. Well, I think we'll we'll in integrate the um, your presentation as a full screen format when we get onto the uh, uh, the, the recording and the um, and the editing. We it was quite small there at moments, but we, I'm sure we'll be able to see it much better in the documentation. So thank you, everyone. And now I'm going to pass on the the mic to Matthew Halpenny, also a, a hexagram student member and part of the um, Critical Gardening co Collective. So Matthew, um, on to you. Perfect. Well, yeah, thank you both for your presentations. And before I go into the, the questions I have for all of you today, I just wanted to say that if anyone in the audience has any questions, uh, you can feel free to raise your hand. So you go at the bottom to reactions and then raise hand, and we'll be happy to include you in the conversation. Um, so, the first question I have is that um, you both talk a lot about uh, the concept of different localities, whether that be um, a way of discussing how we can um, collaborate in different ways during the pandemic, like in the traveling plant project or in the critical gardening collective. Of course, the, the project is based around a very certain locality that forms how you have to form the project and have, how you have to carry out the project and who you can interview, et cetera, things like this. So I just wanted to ask you both if you could expand a little more on how those localities affected the formation of your projects. And I guess um, we could start with a Nick, if that's good. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, um, obviously the project, the traveling plant project started during the, the lockdown. 
right after the lockdown. And, and um, it was this idea that we could not travel anymore around the world. And that maybe there was an opportunity to find something that could travel. And plants are said not to be traveling, which we all know it's not true. But in the common, um, uh, common imaginary of, of the people of, and us, pl plants are staying where they are, right? They are rooted and they don't move. And this idea of taking a plant, something or some, well, a creature, but it's not supposed to move and moving it um, um, from one person to the other all around the world that's what was a, a metaphor of um, um, bringing the world together through this creature, um, this living creature, uh, again, that is um, not supposed to move. And then it's also to, to that um, we are in, it's also reflecting, of course, uh, on, on the, the Anthropocene and, and the critical state we are in um, um, and, and bringing hopefully all the um, continents together. So this location is the entire, it's not a specific location, it's really thought as the entire globe with spots somewhere. Thank you. I also wanted to note if anyone would like a translation um, for this question, we can offer that. But uh, yeah, for the Critical Gardening Collective, if you could go ahead. Sure. Uh, I think there was an element of mystery in the pattern of migration of the mosses. That the fact that we have no idea how these two extremes are connected. And, and Kimner uses this phrase that I fell in love with called aerial plankton to describe the movement of the spores throughout like currents around the globe. But at the same time, I've visited Patagonia and there is something kind of radical and barren. And anyone who spent a lot of time in Northern Canada will understand this as well. The idea of how complex life can be in a place that to humans who are used to lush vegetation seems completely empty. Thierry had for his part worked a bit with the BioArt Society in the North of Finland already. So we were attracted to the idea that there was a kind of a, a, a cahoots of, you know, these two places that for humans seem barren and without value. And yet not only are they incredibly complex in a way that is hard for us to even understand, but that it, it's also that they're in communication with each other somehow. Like there's streams of migration there that, it just, we fell in love with the idea. Like we just wanted to try to find out more about how this works. Thank you. Uh, we also have a question from um, Dan, if uh, you wanna go ahead. Yeah, sure. I was uh, sort of curious, uh, Francois-Joseph said, uh, called uh, bryophytes lower life forms and it kind of um, struck a chord um, and then I was thinking too about the description of the invasive plants and the cruel plants and some sort of human um, thinking about these plants and associating them with the bryophytes, not as threats, but uh, as lower or higher polar bear being having greater value than a, than these bipolar mosses or something um, and the invasive plants as well as being something often negative. And we, we, we move a lot of agricultural plants around and, and some of them cause problems. So I was just sort of wondering about this way of thinking of plants and, and the way they're getting presented uh, as well and the different works that people are doing. That, that's a very good question because when I'm using the phrase uh, lesser life forms, this is not obviously what I think because uh, <laughs> as a phylogeneticist, when you're looking at a phylogeny, you have like the primitive plants and then you have the, the, the derived plants and they're in, in the, the, the human uh, uh, 
uh, you know, conversations uh, among us, we always relate plants with respect to, to us in a very anthropocentric way. So as far as they are from us, they, they seem to be less important. And that's why the polar bear is very charismatic because it's a mammal like us. So we relate to, to, to this. And so the, to, to work with, with the mosses is very important for us because we try to give them value and as uh, Beatrice was saying, they're invisible to us. We walk on, on them, they're on the, the, the crossroads, the crosswalks, they're, they're everywhere, and we don't consider them as important. And so since they are markers of the Anthropocene, they are bioindicators, they're, they're among the, the plants that will uh, be affected by global warming and will be uh, destroyed and disappearing first, they are important, but uh, if you look at Scala Naturae and, and, and the tree of life and the scale of being, they're usually considered as a lesser life forms. But of course, this is not what we think of. <laughs> so hopefully some of that mentality will change. I was just curious too, from the, from the other perspective on the invasive plants, if uh, versus agricultural plants that we move around happily mm -hmm. and people now associate tomatoes with Italy, with they're from the Andes and, and just thinking a little bit about the invasive plants and if a cruel plant is really that cruel and. Oh, this is exactly when the project Cruel of Tucuman is about. Very, um, I forgot the Latin official name of a plant, but the normal name, its vernacular name is Jasmine of Tucuman. And the nice part is that in South America, this plant is just uh, cool. It's nice, it's okay, no problem. It's a host for the monarch butterfly. But when you bring it to Europe, it's um, uh, strangling everything. And so this duality of a plant that can be good in one side and bad in the other, but who says it's good and bad, it's us, okay? The plant in itself doesn't say it's good or bad, it's us. And there is, um, so this project has really many um, uh, unfolding levels, questioning our vision of plants, our labeling of plants. Uh, our projection, anthropomorphic projection of a cruel plant, uh, which of course a plant is not cruel, it's existing, right? Um, so, um, uh, and questioning all our visions about uh, plants. And, um, you know, some people say that um, there is not such a thing as an evasive plant. There are plants that survive better than others. Just basic. Darwin um, uh, theory. Um, so except, except plants often uh, they help each other, whereas animals maybe are more uh, Darwinian in that perspective. And may I ask a question to the to the critical gardening project? Going back to the previous question of location. Um, why didn't you try to go to Antarctica, actually? Because there are um, cultural projects um, in, in, in Antarctica and specifically in the, I mean, one which is, you can go to the Argentinian portion, uh, south of Chile, which is really not that difficult to, or not too strong in terms of temperature. Uh Oh, we'd love to go to Antarctica. It's on the list. Yeah. But um, the one spot that we actually did choose, which is quite close, is particularly known for its mosses. Uh, it's a, a small new center for biodiversity on the island of Navarino. And there is something amazing, something like uh, 30 or 40% of all the known mosses in the world are located on that one island. I, I know with Antarctica itself, a place that I, I, I've looked at a little bit and that we would love to get involved with is actually on the other side, we, uh, below Australia rather, because they're doing some really interesting work around the, the idea of the, the mosses as immortal plants. The, they're, they're, as the ice is melting, there's crusts of, of masses of, of rock, soil, lichen, liverworts, bryophytes that are beginning the process of soil formation, they think, they have no idea. And that's something that I, I, I find completely fascinating too. But for the first trip, we were really trying to find, you know, this, 
this strange place of which is a mass hotspot. Okay. We were also planning to go to a third location in northern Quebec, in Nunavik. Uh, but at one point, we have to decide based on, on uh, expenses, traveling expenses. Oh, yeah. It's very, very expensive to go to Nunavik. And it's probably very expensive I'll go also to go to Antarctica. So we don't want also to bias the collector, the collection size by having like two sites in north and only uh, one in, in the south. So we'll start with these two because we have colleagues and contacts to do the field work there and bryologists, local bryologists. Uh, those are massive specialists. And so that, that's why for now we're not going to Antarctica. All right. Um, I think Nina also had a question. If Nina, you want to jump in? Yes. I would like to say, uh, number one, I would like to ask that uh, are you uh, familiar with Jonathan Keats, who is uh, initiated quite a project about the passports, voting passports for plants? This is one of my questions. And the other one has to do with uh, artist residences. That is not much a question. That's just a comment that uh, although Canada doesn't have artist residences, but New Zealand has and a number of other uh, countries. So if anybody wants to go to Antarctica, I work with some people from there and it's, it's a possibility. Thank you. And we have another question from uh, Maria, if you wanna go ahead. Hi. Yeah, I have one. I want to mention something to the rural plants. I mean, the definition of uh, invasive plants is if they are not on the right place. And with all the globalization, they are moving much faster than they used to, to move around. So that's one of the biggest problem. And for the critical garden, I have a question. Are you working together with architects or with street artists? Because nowadays you can buy a mixture with spurs from moose. And you spray it on concrete, for example, to get it on, yeah, to get a moose garden on a concrete wall. Yeah. Um, no, we're not working with architects or street artists yet. I, I know about the mixtures that you're talking about. Yeah. I, they're more or less successful for more or less short periods of time. Also, depending on the kind of moss that you're using because one of the particularities of moss is that they react really strongly to the substrate that they're placed on. So the-, the And to the water. Yeah, it, more than water, it's the acidity, the, the alkaline, the structure, the porosity of the thing that they're sitting on. So the, the mosses that are usually used, the, and I've seen some of those like images of buildings covered with moss, they tend to be a, a really specific type uh, I forget the, it's the kind that you usually see growing in the cracks in the pavement. They're one of the only ones that love sunshine and very alkaline surfaces. <laughs> and where it's it's not quite like the bipolars that we're working with, but I'm 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 still fascinated by this idea of the various spore mixes that you can do with mosses. Because part of what makes them interesting is that eventually they become soil formers, but they can in theory grow on just about any kind of surface. Yeah, and I would add that the first criteria, first criterion for selecting these mosses is that they have to be bipolar mosses because there's like thousands of other mosses we can work with, but they need to be found at these very remote localities. So the, the, these particular mosses are, are more like uh, uh, mosses that you can find everywhere else in the tropics. And, and something else is, I'm really hoping not to kill whatever we make. Because uh, uh, I know a few of the projects that I've seen, which were absolutely gorgeous for a month or two, um, have wound up dying. Especially architects haven't had quite the ability to keep some of these green roofs and walls going. They, they get very easily infected by pathogens when they're removed from their native environment. So we're, we're trying to like try, uh, really research the horticultural part of it before we commit to you know, installing things. Okay. May I ask you some other qu questions? Um, uh, do, do you um, 
um, do you want to um, include, I mean, the polars, I mean, to be on, on, okay, I start again. They forced me to speak in English, would you believe, um, with French people. Uh, on, you're on the two poles, so it's not by accident. So do you want to build a storyline also about the fact that it's those two poles? And, um, um, and do you want to include some stories that, uh, well, in Antarctica, there is no local people, but in, in the Arctic, there are. So would you like to include some myths or stories around the masses, uh, how they can, you know, be healing um, material or in the Arctic, there are food also for, for the um, les reines, and there is a huge find at the moment um, in the Arctic, um, um, because the land is used for um, oil and so on and so forth, or metaux précieux, metaux rares, terres rares. And, and then the, the, the people have no food left for their years. And so, on. I mean, there is also a lot of political um, issues and stories around uh, masses, not to mention, of course, Japan, but um, apart from Japan, is it something you're interested in or are you, more interested in the um, bio um, uh, approach of it, if that makes sense. Um, <laughs> I'm incapable of thinking about anything without introducing a narrative into it. I just, I, it's my way of functioning. And um, I, sh I should also say that we're hoping to collaborate with the people that we meet there in every way. And for me, I'm an artist, I'm not a biologist. And I'm trying to like learn a lot right now. But as an artist, I'm well, always- working with, with one scientist, so. <laughs> I'm working with many. <laughs> I, but for me, the more specific information that I can have, the reason I'm fascinated by the, the, the world vantage point of biology is because the more specific the, the biochemistry and the idea of ecosystem becomes, for me, it, it frees me up more. Like I, I feel like it's opening up all sorts of worldviews that I otherwise would not have been able to structure by myself. And I'm hoping that the equivalent as far as a narrative structure will be similar, that the more that we're, we manage to engage with the people that we need as we're traveling, the more that we'll be able to introduce other people's vantage point and stories into it. And I should say that in the region that we're visiting in the South in Patagonia, there is a huge uh, population of, of native tribes as well. There's a there's some beautiful projects of translation between languages for because one of the things that they've discovered is that the vocabulary that the population of the island of Navarino specifically had to describe its environment is far more sophisticated than anything that exists in the Spanish language. And there's some interesting projects of translation going on that are hoping in the long term to try to introduce some languages back into the vocabulary for school kids to learn about what they're seeing around them. Because right now there is literally no language to describe their environment, which is one of the things that I, I haven't figured out how to incorporate but that I just find so beautiful and I can't wait to find out more about. And that's why a huge part of the project will be to make interviews with scientists and specialists. We have a list of about 40 of those and we wanna ask two, two series of questions. How can you explain the bipolar nature of these masses? How do they go about traveling from one spot to the other? What is the, the, the past history in biogeography? But also we're interested to look at the umwelt of, of, of these masses. How do they relate to their specific environment? Or in, in ecology would say, what is the ecological niche? What, what are their, their needs and, 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 ex, and explain uh, the, the, the local conditions in which they, they thrive and that with the Anthropocene may, may go away. So we have a lot of people that we will uh, uh, interview. And of course, th this will build a narrative in addition to the local communities that are living with these plants. All right, so there's been a lot of great discussion here. Um, one thing that I was curious to hear more about um, is kind of the temporal aspect of things. So we've talked a lot about migration, but I know that plants, um, when they migrate, they have a bit of a different time scale than us because we're talking about 
intergenerationality, um, spores, seeds. And um, yeah, I think it'd be really interesting if, if anyone has the any knowledge about temporalities in their project. So for mosses, maybe a bit of more deep time of mosses and uh, how these temporalities relate to how you're thinking about mosses. Um, so maybe the Critical Gardening Collective could start with that and then we'll move on to the Traveling Plant, plant Project. Oh, uh, Matthew, I, I didn't quite uh, hear what you were saying, but you were talking about, about scale, right? Time scale. Time scale. Yeah, time scales. Yeah. yeah. Well, of course, when we're working with plants, we're working with a different time scale <laughs> uh, with respect to the, to the human scale. Uh, we're working with the geological scale, we're working with a different phylogenetic scale, and of course we're working with a different time scale. What is the life cycle of these mosses as opposed to our own life cycle? So for us, the temporal scale is very important because uh, if we look, at, if, if you sit uh, and wait to, to see what, what's happening with, with the mosses, nothing will happen. So we have to to, to change our own senses, change our own way of looking at things, change, change our way of listening. And this is what the, the remote locations will try to capture and bring back the, the data to the, to the local garden or the botanical garden. Do you wanna add something with respect to that, Bea? I think the only thing that I would say is that I, it's something that I haven't actually dealt with yet. I find it consistently shocking how completely slow everything is. I'm looking at things with a hand lens, getting very excited when I see a tiny bite of green emerging. And then I realize it's been three months and that we could very well be waiting for three years to have any like actual growth. <laughs> but at the same time, if we get a, an ecosystem established, it could very well live for 400 years. Right, and I know that, um, yeah, some of these mosses, like we've talked about, can take like hundreds of years to colonize depending on the species. So um, yeah, it's always something to think about. And I know that each plant has different time scales. I know the, pro the plants that you're dealing with in the Traveling Plant Project, Nick, would probably be a little different, but I know you also talk a lot about migration in that project and specifically with the, the cruel plant. Um, so if you'd like to maybe expand a little bit more about the, the temple aspect. Yeah, actually the time scale is at the core of the traveling plant project. Um, the, the artwork the cruel of Tucuman is an artwork that uh, and, and, uh, an event uh, that has been created in Barcelona in 21 and that's it. So um, our goal is not to travel this project uh, again, the idea is not to travel artworks, but to travel the surrogate body of a plant and to have a new creation or, or the exhibition of an event uh, wherever this plant, this surrogate body goes. Uh, and as I said, it's a curatorial project. And usually how does it go in, uh, I mean, there are too many uh, curators in this uh, sec session today, so they very well know, and too many artists, and they very well know. So you have an exhibition on the 12th of May, and everything has to be collected and put together on the 12th of May. And you put a huge effort and a huge energy and a lot of stress and everybody comes together and we have a wonderful opening and then eventually there is the exhibition for a few something days, weeks, months, and then boom, gone. You put everything back in crates and it's, it's over. And the curators have already moved to another, you know, thinking to the next exhibition and the artists or, oh, um, uh, in May, I mean, um, I don't know, in Montreal, in June, I'm in Venice and so on and so forth. And, and there, there, there was, and still is this kind of hectic um, movement and, and, and uh, the, the critical gardening talked, no, it was um, the laser people talked about movement. So there is this hectic movement of artworks and exhibitions, artists and curators uh, are moving around like mad electrons. And with a traveling plan, we decided that the goal was not to achieve 200 exhibitions in two years uh, in collaboration with, because again, we are not organizing the exhibitions or the events we are working in collaboration with. Uh, we don't care. 
I mean, uh, if um, uh, it takes the time it takes. It takes the time for people to come to us, or for us to come to people, the time to fundraise for the host of a plant, the time to fundraise for us. Um, we, and not necessarily, we, the team, what we call the seed team, the five of us are not necessarily going to travel. And this is important. Um, maybe we would like to, but it's not mandatory. And, um, and we'll take time. We'll take time to build the project. And the project, we, there is no end to the project at this moment in time. We end the project whenever the five of us are fed up with it. So I may be fed up with a project next year, but there are four other people. So until the five of us think, oh, I give up, the project is running. And what we, we, we want to achieve is also trying to work on a different uh, curatorial and model. And it's not necessarily exhibition. It can be a dinner with a few friends. It can be a garden project somewhere, wherever. It can be a lecture. So the idea is that it's really uh, open and slow. We want it slow. Mm -hmm. um, and I know in your work you talk about, um, well, uh, some of the collaborators talk about the concept of vegetality and um, what it means to kind of be a plant. And um, in this concept of vegetality, there's this notion of uh, the word migration coming from um, the splitting of a seed. And I was wondering if, um, do you think that that splitting of the seed and that migration, um, if we're trying to relate better to plants, we have to take kind of this intergenerational approach into consideration? Whom are you asking? Oh, I, sorry, I was asking, uh, directing it to you, but... Um, okay. Uh, we are asking everyone. I mean, um, um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's as open as possible. It can be... Yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm talking for myself here. We are five of us and the others might have slightly different uh, flavor in their in the approaches. Um, I don't want to segment, you know, young, elder, uh, this, that, uh, rural, uh, urban, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to do a collection of categories and subcategories and sub 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 categories. I'm not doing the, the uh, Getty uh, Fizoris here. Uh, 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 it's everything that people can come up with, that people that are interested in the project come up with. Mm -hmm. And people means every kind of human. Because I don't think yet that we can work with some bees to organize an exhibition. This might be difficult in the exchanges. Mm -hmm. But if a bee on my balcony wants to organize an exhibition in the flowers on, on my balcony, I'll be happy. I might not understand what it's doing, but I'll be happy. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I did have one question you, for yeah. If I can um, ask a question to to Anik, because uh, I was looking at your at your map and I see Toronto, which was the closest location to Montreal, as one of your hubs. Uh, so, uh, as I understand it, you, you're open to uh, any other places, so you can travel to Montreal. I'm sure that some of us and and, and Giselle probably wouldn't be would be interested to to host you and and do something here. I would be super happy. I mean, this is really open. So contact us, we are slow because we are doing other things and we are not yet funded for this project. So we're applying also for funding. If you look at the map, the map is wrong. <laughs> and this is something which is extremely important for us too. The map looks like a real map. I mean, the true, uh, accurate map. But if you look at where the cities are located mm -hmm. and the distance between the cities, it's wrong. And this is on purpose. But I'll be super happy to come to, actually the nice thing in Canada is that, you know, it's a huge country, so we could do coast to coast. 
But maps are always wrong anyway. <laughs> um, Francois Joseph, I had a question for you actually. So um, if we kind of return to the idea of scale, I know um, in things like mosses, there's whole kind of microcosms of organisms that live amongst them. And I'm wondering if we're trying to kind of uh, communicate these organisms to other people, how do we talk about uh, the, this difference between the visible and the invisible soils? Well, that, that's quite interesting because as part of my work, uh, I work with microbiome. So I'm interested in the holobiome and, and we have like cibri cibriont here and, and the, the symbiont. And so the biont is, is, is not there uh, by, by, by chance. It's because the, these plants cannot thrive without the, the, the chemicals, uh, the soil uh, nutrients, and of course the bacteria and, and, and other microorganisms living there. And so that's why we were interested working also with, with you, Matthew, in microbial fuel cells. The microbial fuel cells are bacteria uh, from the soil that, can, that we can harvest to get some, some tiny, tiny amount of energy to, to control the, 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 the camera or, or, or Wi-Fi or whatever that will collect data on, on these plants. And so they're part of the, the art installation but they're also part of the community. They're part of, of, the, of the living environments where the plants are living. So we don't see that, of course, but if we get rid of all these microorganisms, of course, the plants will die. If we get rid of all the nutrients, of course, the, the, these mosses uh, will die. So it's also a, a different layer. We were talking about the temporal layer. Now we're talking about a, a spatial layer in terms of a, the, the global geography of the globe, the localities where the, the mosses, the, the patches where they, they thrive and where they, they're, 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 they die. And at the local, local, uh, what's underneath, uh, what, what's living there, it's also very, very important. Right, so I, I know that because these environments are so complex and uh, the moss has both like the micro environment and the macro environment, um, when we're trying to communicate things about the mosses, I know you talked about the concept of the umwelt and I was wondering if you could maybe um, just expand on ways that the umwelt factors into the work. So when we're trying to maybe put sensors or different uh, cameras, et cetera, on the mosses, um, how do we kind of avoid this um, anthro like anthro projection onto the mosses? Well, I mean, this is an ongoing question for us. It's, and I always wonder if it's not a, if it's an avoidable trap of always reinserting our human vantage point into these researches, or if there is actually any way to snap out of that. I think one of the things that we're trying to do is to use the technology that we are using and the sensors that we are using, not so much as a form of gathering data, but as a way of expanding it almost as a mechanism for translation between the vantage point of the universe of the mosses and the plants, the umwelt, and our own ability to try to understand that. One of the, one of the things that we're trying to do is, and it's one of the reasons we decided to try to work with the minor life and the moss in the first place, is because they are not objects of exchange in the commercial world of humans. So a, a lot of the things that would give them value, that would drive the vantage point of a human-centered universe are completely missing in this case. So in a way, we're, we're constantly forced to reassess their, their universe basically from, from our point of view, but also trying to expand that using technology. So it's, 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 a, it's an odd way because we're trying to use it almost in the way you would in, in a robotics project where you're trying to like imagine what the stimulus, stimulus is, what the intake is, and you're not doing it so much for an accurate measurement, but almost as an active faith and narration and fiction creating because we are trying to understand what this world is. Mm -hmm. I like that you brought the, the concept of fiction back into it because you know that ties very well with um, the traveling plant project and narratives. Um, and you know, not trying to say that what we're saying, the moth, like how we're capturing the moss is the literal interpretation, but more of a, a dialogue and, and a narrative. Oh, Questions of 
I was thinking of a lot of the questions that have come up on the idea of invasive species, on the idea of travel, and I can't help but wonder if what we're not trying to think our way to is trying to imagine if we have a possibility of developing uh, co-evolution at a faster rate in a sense. Because, I mean, what makes an invasive an invasive? It's that it's been yanked out of its home and placed in an environment where it can't quite communicate with the rest of the little niche. And it can be a collapse of chemical signals at the end. And I, and I was wondering, as humans, is there a method that we could use to try to understand a form of co-evolution with plants <laughs> rather than just using them. And I think in that sense, the moss are beautiful because they, they are used as a, I mean, when people are studying them, they're studying them because they can be considered autonomous self-contained ecosystems already. They are literally like micro forests. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about mosses, but there's all sorts of bacteria, microbes, insects, uh, other types of spores. It, it's a super complex system. Mm -hmm. um, I'd also just like to let everyone know we have 15 minutes left, so we're gonna we're gonna go to Anna's question now, and then we'll continue. Um, I'm trying to. Okay. Um, you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Okay, that's fine. But you can you hear me? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> hi, Anik. Uh, hi, uh, uh, Beatrice hi, and Francois. Thank you for, for your presentations. Um, one reflection that I would like to ask both of you, and um, maybe first part is um, to you, Anik. Um, well, it's just something that I've been thinking about a lot in, in the sense of the question about technology. So um, the question is, um, sort of multi manifold, but in a sense, like when we talk about and think about curatorial practices and obviously think about traveling less in the context of climate change and the environment, et cetera. And um, so, so here, okay, hello. <laughs> so here, um, we are in a sense, trying to think about different ways of functioning, of curating, of being. And yet we are, um, here we are on Zoom. And um, so it's kind of like a reflection of how can we balance? I mean, how can we balance the idea of not traveling a lot and curating like met, met curators or artists and producing a lot? And, and yet, does that not push us into using technology, which is, as we know, not very environmentally friendly? So, and in a sense, similar question to, not exactly the same to, to the Critical Garden Collective, like just more generally, like what, what is your relationship and how would you say how this technology plays part in your project and um, in a sense of how does it create, um, well, I don't wanna say interface, but it's an important element in the sense of how we interact and, and what does it mean? What does it mean the interaction through technology with technology? Just if you have any reflections on that on both of you, thank you. Wow, this is a <laughs> ten dollar question. Um, I'm talking for myself. I'm speaking for myself here again, and not for the whole collective. I'm totally ambiguous and totally uh, in contradiction with myself, um, meaning that um, I'm part of a traveling plan project, and it's a project very dear to my to my heart. Uh, at um, where people elsewhere would curate things instead of me doing it. Uh, and at the same, not, not necessarily me traveling. And at the same time, the only thing I want to do is to go to the airport and, and go to the next place, okay? So uh, I'm dreaming of uh, traveling as I used to. So 
this is how do we collectively and I personally deal with this contradiction? Uh, uh, I don't have the answer. Uh, in the terms of the technology, this is something which is highly interesting because for years we thought, we thought that technology was neutral and neutral in terms of impact. Uh, this is obviously not true and it's getting worse and worse. Uh, apart from the fact that we, we pretend we are together, which is uh, in a way true, but we know this is not exactly true for, for this screen. Um, um, this is again a very much contradiction for me who has been involved in technological art uh, of all sorts for, for the last 40, you, you know, many years. Uh, uh, I tend to be less and less interested by the technology. And I try to resist as much as I can to uh, Zoom um, um, platform or only Zoom platform for mediation. Um, so in other words, when I, 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 um, I, I try not to do only online uh, things. In short, I don't have the answer to your questions. <laughs> Thank I mean, you. a real serious <laughs> answer. It's, I know it's difficult I'm in the sense I'm throwing back to what I struggle as well, but that's, yeah, that's, that's a, thank you, Anik, yeah. And, and I guess we're in the same position as, as Anik because uh, we're working with bipolar muscles, but we're also with, working with, with bipolar standpoints with respect to how scholars are approaching the Anthropocene. You can have the techno solutionist agenda, trying to solve everything with technology. Or on the other side, you can have the collapsology, everything is going down the drain. And we're trying not to take side or being cut in, in the middle by uh, not uh, 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 freezing a narrative that will go uh, either way. So we're trying to interview the masses and ask them what, what they think by interviewing the researchers who are working uh, with them. You want to add uh, something? Yeah, I mean, part of this is also me speaking personally, but I've always had a complete love-hate relationship to technology. And this was back even when I was trying to do more um, media-based robotic works. But in our, in our own project, something that, that we decided when we were imagining what a garden could actually look like and what these like spore little satellites we were going to be sending out into environmentally sensitive areas were going to be like, we decided that we wanted to, <laughs> and this was, it seems fantastical now, we, we decided nothing will be made of plastic, everything will be completely autonomous, we're going to follow the Batesonian definition of cybernetic organization of a system, which will be self-feeding and it didn't take a lot of reading or, or planning or plotting out of circuitry to realize that it's literally impossible to do anything in this day and age in the world without plastic. And it, it sort of has led to a, I would call it a slow collapse mm -hmm. of our <laughs> idealism, in a, which in its own way has become fascinating because it mirrors uh, a logical slow collapse of a lot of our best intentions today as a contemporary society. And what we've chosen as an approach, even though we don't have an answer, is to actually turn that as part of the project. Uh, where do all the inputs and the outputs come from and go to die? Where, who, who is making the materials that we are going to be working with? And where will they wind up in what landfill and what is the path that they will follow? Because I think another thing with the Anthropocene is that we tend to hold ourselves apart from it. And I think it's rightfully criticized as a form of its own arrogance. So I think something else that we're trying to engage with is how we, the human animals, are actually, what our life cycle is. You know, what would be, what is the true Batesonian sense of cybernetic distribution that we have? And even trying to find that out, and, and Matthew has been on the receiving end of a lot of this because we kept rejecting a lot of what he was proposing as, as uh, prototypes. Um, we don't know, but we intend to find out even if we don't like the answer. 
We wish we could be virtuous, but we've realized that we're completely compromised. Um, on that note, we kind Thank of you. wanted to uh, talk about technology in a different way. I know that the garden is a very central aspect of um, both projects, specifically the Critical Gardening Collective, of course. But um, of course, the garden is a technology in itself, like a very, very early technology that one that humans have used in both um, more symbiotic, multi-species collaborative ways, but it can also be a very anthropocentric means of controlling plants. So like sometimes maybe the plants don't benefit from this technology. And I was wondering, just, just rolling off what you guys were talking about, um, you know, how do we even view these technologies that aren't maybe electronic? Um, how do we view them in ways that we can work symbiotically and not use the technologies in ways that would impact um, non-human life forms negatively? Do you mean, wait, are we on? Do you mean, I'm not sure I quite understand the question. Do you mean in the sense, again, of going back to the idea of intergenerational spatial involvement? Do you mean like, a, because the technology is not really, oh, yeah, you mean like more in the sense of agricultural monoculture where you would have some fluid yeah. feeding a plant to make it grow. No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> we're just going to, if things die, things will die. It, what will happen will happen. What we're here to do is to set up in the most thoughtful way possible, the conditions necessary to allow an ecosystem that is, um, there's, a, there's actually a phrase for it in uh, ecological horticulture today, they're called novel ecosystems, which is uh, you start from the vantage point that we are compromised, that there is um, no pristine environment left in the world, that it is, you know, what Gilles Clément discusses in his own work, where, we are working with invasives. There is a fourth nature. It has been manipulated beyond recognition. So all we can hope to do is use the technology to try to understand the invisible symbiosis that is already there and see what we can do. To be less abstract about it, I'll give you uh, one really specific example. There's people who are actually working with invasive species now in gardens as a form of bioremediation, a reclama reclamation of really deeply polluted areas. And the way that they literally do it is they might have aggressive plant completely surrounded by a circle of equally aggressive native species. So it's kind of like uh, the idea of ecological patches taken to the nth degree. And I think that this is where technology becomes useful. It's not about feeling good because we can measure everything. It's more of what is it that we are failing to see that maybe we can try to begin to imagine because there's this thing that's as close as I can come to it. Right. Um, you're, you brought up the whole um, remediative garden and it kind of reminded me, this is a little off topic, but you have kind of um, mycelial gardens that are used to remediate uh, spill sites and things like this. So kind of using that organism in a way that, I don't know, it's, it's difficult to say because that's probably not what the mushrooms want and what the mycelium want, but it seems to, a lot of the times they can even digest this matter and it is beneficial, but yeah, using these technologies in ways that aren't necessarily electronic and just multi-species based. Um, anyway, Giselle had a question for quite a while, so I'm going to let Giselle go. Well, just a comment, really, because I think it's unfortunate to consider technologies as machines. Um, I think it's technologies is nature and, uh, te it's, it, and technologies. It's not technology. It's not like one technology. So it's it, and as nature is multiple and, and, and ever, completely effervescent. And I think the question of technologies is a question of relation and not, uh, again, strictly about, um, let's say, a human made machine. The plants have their own technologies, trees have their technologies, and, and, and technologies is about, is about um, cultivating relations. So just wanted to throw that in. And, um, and also the fact that also with Haraway is that we're not going to solve it. There is no answer. Uh, but we sh it shouldn't prevent us from trying to do things. And I, I think if in the art, uh, the art world has a lot of things to look at in the way that it produces art, but at the same time, 
it's the medical industry, there's transport, there's, there's, there's so many that are so huge, agriculture, that I think that, you know, I think we should not be too hard on ourselves. Uh, I think we should be helping each other to do these works. And that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we're coming close to the end. Um, I have another short question, if, if someone would like to end on that note. Um, I feel like a big recurring theme here is trying to create um, communication and relations with other species beyond the human. Um, and I was wondering if anyone has any tips in their, their own work or know of other works where there's ways that human can collaborate with non-human species. So how do we, or the, how do we as humans engage with these other species and how do we kind of create these bridges? Um, maybe, um, and Nick, if you want to talk about the relation in your work. Um, I think this is a very weird uh, issue that came up of how do we collaborate with non-human? Because as far as I know, we have collaborated with non-humans since the very beginning we arrived. I mean, we emerged on this planet. Uh, and the others, some of the others were there be before us. I mean, that are still around. I'm not talking about the dinosaur. So I think that there is this uh, um, somehow naive and feel good attitude of let's collaborate with non-humans. Well, tell me how you do not collaborate with non-humans. Uh, we can talk about how we badly collaborate with non-humans, but, but we are. Um, and to answer the previous question, um, and it's what Beatrice said, it's not about feeling good. Uh, the whole issue is not about feeling good. It's, we cannot embrace complexity because complexity is too complex in a way for us to, to cope with it. We can just try and, and acknowledge complexity. And um, one ethicist who turns out to be also a priest once said that we, uh, uh, that we have to remember that life and living is creating waste. So the issue for me uh, and for many of us is not to, not to produce waste because we are producing waste, end of a story. So, but what kind of waste are we producing? This is maybe where we can try to find solutions, including technologies, yes, uh, Giselle. So for me, the issue is there and there is no, there is no good and bad and uh, no moral, no uh, good conscious or bad conscious there. Um, do you want to expand on it, Francois Joseph or Beatrice? Well, uh, I should say that I don't like to collaborate with others. I like to cultivate others. I like to exploit others. I like to eat them. I like to kill them like any life form is doing on a daily basis. So I think it's it's a bit uh, uh, anthropocentric to try to project our own system values on, on, on lesser life forms like bacteria or plants. And, and the issue of consent never comes up. Uh, do we ask them to collaborate with us? Do these plants want to travel? Uh, <laughs> They, they, they travel on their own, they don't need us. And, and invasive species can be invasive because of, of, of human uh, taking these plants to, or, or, or insects or, or, or uh, fishes to, to a, a different location, but they travel on their own. They've been traveling before us and they will travel uh, after us. So the issue of collaborating, I, I don't really relate to, to, to such a, a term, uh, we, we live with them. They, they live with us, they live uh, on us, around us and inside of us, uh, uh, algae and bacteria and yeast and, and, and other microorganisms and they're, they're part of us. So every time that we're trying to, 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 to use a, a new verb that, that uh, uh, changes the focus on how we relate uh, to them, it's, I'm, I'm still uh, feeling uneasy with, with these, uh, these uses. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're, we're nearing the end. So I'd like to thank you all for everything you've contributed to this conversation. Um, definitely learned a lot here. And I think 
Giselle has some last words to say. Yes, thank you, Matthew, for your wonderful questions that you worked on. I'm very pleased with our, our new format that we're exploring here. And I think uh, one thing we could do is maybe more hybrid, like live and Zoom and mix, keep it mixing it up. And um, really, thank you so much, everyone, for being there. Merci. Merci beaucoup. J'ai aussi beaucoup appris. Et j'ai aussi été très sensible à, à, à tout ce qui a été tout ce qui a été dit et évidemment toutes les démarches qui sont en jeu. Alors euh, encore merci beaucoup. And Nina, did you want to add something? Merci Chantal, merci Chantal, merci Hexagram, merci la vie. <laughs> I would like to thank everybody, uh, especially Matthew, because I it's quite a difficult role. To, in such a mixed company and uh, it is so you know in this locked up feeling because we are still locked up to a certain extent so it's a fantastic feeling to meet again and to uh, talk again about issues which really are very important for each and every one of us so thank you again and thank you Giselle uh, we look back for many years of collaboration. Thank you very much, Giselle. And thank you to Sylvain Obey, who was our back channel person taking care of the Zoom and um, looking forward to seeing everybody in the future. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Merci, Merci à tout le monde. Au Et à bientôt quelque part en vrai. Oui. <laughs> oui. Avec un gros impact de CO2. <laughs> <laughs> Ciao.